welcome and thank all of you for coming tonight to our event, The Recovery of Original Intent, that the Heritage Foundation is co-hosting with the Project on Constitutional Originalism and the Catholic Intellectual Tradition at the Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law. The members of our panel tonight will engage a series of questions that go to the core of legal interpretation. We are quite familiar with progressive interpretive methods that assign moral agency to history, updating the Constitution and statutes according to the evolving needs of the times, which always seem to move in an egalitarian or a liberated direction. On this score, consider the astonishing words of Justice Anthony Kennedy in Lawrence versus Texas. Had those who drew and ratified the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment known the components of liberty and its manifold possibilities, they might have been more specific. They did not presume to have this insight. They knew times can blind us to certain truths, and later generations can see laws once thought necessary and proper, in fact, only serve to oppress. As the Constitution endures, persons in every generation can invoke its principles in the search for greater freedom, end quote. And of course, it falls to federal judicial officials to define this direction for us. Alternatively, originalism and its dominant school of original public meaning looks to interpret the Constitution according to the public meaning of the terms at the time a provision of law was enacted. Originalism, however, has many schools or nuances of thought and interpretive results can vary, sometimes widely. Certain originalists look to the meaning that it would have to a reasonable hypothetical observer. Still other originalists make a distinction between interpretation and construction. I say this not to quibble, but to note that originalism has itself become a rather broad church for its members. But what about the intent and will of the lawmaker? Was this fairly or unfairly dismissed by leading methods of legal thought, including what became the dominant tenor of originalism. Our event tonight, alternatively, will consider, consider if we have forgotten something that is basic to the beginning of written laws in the Western legal tradition. If law is just the written instrument that was made by a lawmaker, then should not the essence of interpretation be to discern and apply the will of the lawmaker. If that's true, then it seems, the dominant interpretive schools have been looking in all the wrong places, foregoing inquiries into what the lawmaker was trying to do and why the lawmaker was trying to do it. Is reviving intentionalism the way out of a seemingly irresolvable contest between judicial policymaking or a search for textual clarity? I know that our panelists tonight will thoroughly engage this debate and leave us with greater understanding and curiosity. I now invite the members of our panel to the stage, which will be moderated by Kevin Walsh, co-director of the Project on Constitutional Originalism and the Catholic Intellectual Tradition. He is also a professor of law at Catholic University's Columbus School of Law. Professor Walsh's scholarship focuses on the scope of federal judicial power and his work has appeared in the Georgetown Law Journal, the Stanford Law Review, the New York University Law Review, and the Notre Dame Law Review, and in many other publications. He previously taught at Richmond School of Law for 13 years. He practiced law at Hunt and Williams. He clerked for Justice Antonin Scalia on the Supreme Court of the United States and for Judge Paul Niemeyer on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Professor Walsh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you to our hosts here at the Heritage Foundation and to all of you for being here this evening. Um, on behalf of the Project on Constitutional Originalism and the Catholic Intellectual Tradition, I welcome you to our first collaboration uh, with the Heritage Foundation. Just say a word about CIT, which is our, our project at the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America. We're dedicated to the scholarly exploration of the relationship between American constitutionalism and the Catholic intellectual tradition through programs like this one, 
through fellowships for uh, law students and young legal professionals, uh, lectures, related events. So uh, our website is cit.catholic.edu. Uh, we've been up to a lot, and I invite you to, have to, to explore further. As Richard uh, mentioned, I'm Kevin Walsh, co-director of the project, along with my Columbus Law colleague, Joelle Alisea. And this evening's program on the revival of original intent is going to be a very good one. Uh, each of our, each of our uh, panelists will offer an opening statement, and then uh, I will facilitate the discussion, open the floor for questions. So um, we heard the voice of God to begin uh, this, or uh, it's a technical term, I'm told. Uh, and, and, uh, but we also have uh, the AV facilitated. So our first speaker will be Professor uh, Donald uh, Drakeman, Distinguished Research Professor at the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government, the University of Notre Dame. He will be followed by Professor Richard Eakins, Professor of Law and Constitutional Government, St. John's College, University of Oxford. And third will be Tara Grove, Vincent and Elkins Chair in Law at the University of Texas. Texas at Austin School of Law. I'll skip what you can read about these scholars from their web pages and just uh, tell you uh, I always like to make one or two recommendations for um, these people. So for Professor uh, Drakeman, I recommend his 2022 book from Cambridge University Press, The Hollow Core of Constitutional Theory, Why We Need the Framers. Uh, for Professor Eakins, take a look at his 2012 book from Oxford University Press, The Nature of Legislative Intent, as well as uh, my favorite in an American law review is a 2017 article in Constitutional Commentary called The Object of Interpretation. Uh, for Professor Grove, my law school classmate, I could, uh, could commend you an entire Supreme Court issue from the time that we were together, but uh, more recently, I would say take a look at the November 2020 issue of the Harvard Law Review for her comment on the Bostock uh, case, as well just two weeks ago in the Northwestern University uh, Law Review called The Misunderstood History of Textualism. Uh, but now I commend to you our speakers, and we'll begin with Professor Drakeman. Thanks very much, and thank you all for giving me the chance to appear virtually today. Uh, just wave, Kevin, if, if you can hear me, so I know that I'm on. Great. All right. So today, I just want to defend one very simple proposition, that the original meaning of the Constitution is what it originally meant. That seems pretty straightforward, and what it means is that we need to determine the original meaning the same way that laws were interpreted at the time the Constitution was adopted. We know how founding era judges and lawyers were taught to interpret written laws. The goal was to determine the lawmaker's intent. The objective meaning of the text, or what Blackstone called the words in their usual and most known signification, offered important evidence, but that was not the ultimate goal. Cook's Institutes have been called the universal text for educating American lawyers in the founding era. They said, every statute ought to be interpreted according to the intent of them that made it. The other primary textbook was Blackstone, who said the fairest and most rational method to interpret the will of the legislator is by exploring his intentions at the time when the law was made. James Wilson said the same thing in his law lectures, as did Joseph Story in his commentaries. As late as the turn of the 20th century, Penn's Law Dean published a commentary echoing the very same theme. Nevertheless, until recently, originalists have tended to follow Justice Scalia's guidance. What I look for in the Constitution is the original meaning of the text, not what the original draftsman intended. Now, why would he say that? Because, as Justice Scalia said, references to intent have led to more poor interpretations than any other phenomenon in judicial decision making. But that, I would say, is really just an overreaction to cases like Everson with its wall of separation between church and state. That case wasn't based on the framers' intent, despite all the references to Madison and Jefferson. The justices' private papers show that they wanted to prevent Roman Catholic influences 
in education, particularly in you know, grade school and high school. It was really just a living constitution conclusion dressed up with cherry-picked quotations from framers that fit the need. Well, that's not a problem with the framers' intentions. That's a problem with the justices' intentions. They wanted to substitute their own church-state preferences for the ones that the framers had actually chosen. If we focus on what the First Amendment framers were trying to accomplish, and not what James Madison said at a different time, in a different place, about an entirely different issue, we get to a different outcome. Their goal was simply to say that Congress could not set up a national church like the Church of England. That's it. Now, beyond Justice Scalia's worries about results, there are two other classic arguments against intent. One is the so-called summing problem, how to find one intention representing all of the framers. That actually isn't as hard as it sounds. The question of how to determine a single intention of a lawmaking body has been around as long as legislatures have. Professor Eakins, in fact, has written a terrific book on that topic, the one just recommended to you by Professor Walsh. The individual framers may have initially hoped for a range of different outcomes, which is where the cherry-picked quotations often come from. But then the arguments and the bargaining began. Ultimately, when it came to the final language, they knew they were voting on a provision representing a particular way to address a specific issue. People voting both for and against a provision can understand it the same way. That understanding, what Professor Eakins calls the law's ends and means, or essentially what Blackstone called the mischief and the remedy, is the understanding we need to look for. Now, by the way, for those of you who worry that the so-called mischief rule can lead to judicial mischief, it's important to note that the mischief always needs to be paired with the remedy. That is, it's the combination of fully negotiated ends and means that represents the will of the lawmaker, not anything a judge thinks that might relate to the underlying mischief. Meanwhile, as I first learned in a wonderful collaboration with Professor Alice Sayer, public meaning originalism has its own summing problem. In a nation of immigrants spread across a large territory, some terms had different meanings in different parts of the country. The public meaning in New England could be very different than the one in the South. The only way to know which is the right one is by focusing on the framers' intentions, as Justice and Framer William Patterson said in the court's first exercise of judicial review in 1796. The other issue is the argument that the ratifiers, not the framers, were the constitutional lawmaker. But the only reason we think that is because we have fallen into a trap set by the framers. Revisions to the Articles of Confederation needed the agreement of every state legislature. Instead, the framers invented ratification, which only needed the approval of nine state special conventions. The Constitution replaced the Articles of Confederation solely on the framers' own say-so. Ratification is one of legal history's great misdirects. It's a classic Wizard of Ozian, pay no attention to the framers behind the curtain. Now, I'd like to end by highlighting one of Professor Grove's key points in a recent Harvard Law Review article. She argues that a formalistic textualism best serves the court's need for sociological legitimacy, which is essentially the public's confidence in the Supreme Court. She's certainly right about legitimacy, but sola scriptura textualism is unsustainable as a practical matter. For the originalism political movement of the last few decades, it's been a rhetorically useful, clear, and straightforward message designed to rein in overly creative justices. But commentators for centuries have pointed out that it is not adequate to deal with the complexities of either law or language over the longer term. Moreover, from a legitimacy perspective, if the justices embrace intentionalism, they will be doing just what the public wants. A poll of 1,000 Americans says that over 90% think the court should at least consider 
the Constitution's annual, um, original meaning. So that's people who call themselves living constitutionalists and people who call themselves originalists. Ninety percent think that the original meaning has at least some relevance for the court's decision. And when asked what is the most important evidence of that original meaning, two-thirds believe that the framers' intentions are the most important evidence of the meaning. Lately, we've seen a number of constitutional theorists begin to turn towards the intentionalism that the public already expects. Jurisprudentially, that's a good thing and has the added benefit of being the popular choice. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I can see we're going to have a very uh, robust discussion. Uh, <laughs> Professor Eakins, to you. Well, thank you, Kevin, uh, for that kind introduction. I should um, add my, my thanks to the, the Heritage Foundation for hosting us tonight and my um, appreciation for the Catholic University of America in supporting this, this new initiative on the Catholic intellectual tradition and originalism, an initiative with which I'm delighted to, uh, to be associated. I want to talk about intentionalism in the theory and practice of statutory interpretation, taking in the question of how the legislature's intention, legislative intent, frames statutory interpretation. Most of my research has concerned statutory rather than constitutional interpretation, although in the article that Kevin mentioned, I have uh, um, crossed swords with Cass Sunstein uh, about constitutional interpretation. And I have a long unpublished paper on the Constitution as an enactment, which I'm happy to share with anyone who might be interested. For those whose primary interest is constitutional interpretation, I would suggest there's uh, still very good reason to think long and hard about how statutory interpretation works. To my mind, it's in one sense the simpler and more general category, which brings into sharp focus the relationship between authority, text, and law. When I teach constitutional interpretation in Oxford, I do so by starting with statutory interpretation and the relationship between acts of legislating and the law that legislation makes before widening out or turning to the, the more uh, particular or special case of the Constitution. Our subject tonight is the revival or the recovery of, of um, uh, original intent. And it's striking to see, as, um, uh, as Don uh, pointed to, how central the will of the lawmaker has been to legal thought and practice in historical perspective. For centuries, the common, the common law tradition of statutory interpretation has centred on recognising, articulating legislative intent. Blackstone, one amongst many, readily affirming that. The same thing is true in legal and political philosophy. Figures as diverse as Thomas Hobbes and Thomas Aquinas uh, sharing a focus on the legislative will. The historical tradition, the philosophical um, uh, tradition, historical practice, philosophical tradition comes under a lot of pressure in the 20th century. Legal realists, uh, notably Max Radin, pouring scorn on the idea that a uh, Congress or a Parliament might have, might form a single will. And that scepticism taken up, amplified by Ronald Dworkin and Jeremy Waldron in the, the late 20th century. They share a common critique. Groups don't have intentions, to boil it down but their concerns are very different. It seems to me that Ronald Dworkin was aiming to clear legislative intent from the stage so that only Justice Hercules would be able to speak for the law, to be the mouthpiece of the law. Jeremy Waldron, by contrast, aimed to vindicate the role of the legislature in public life. But he thought the idea of legislative intention could only distort our understanding of legislative practice. And some theoretically minded judges have echoed those concerns, those criticisms, decrying legislative intent as irrelevant or dangerous, trivial or radical, if you like, and likely to distort interpretive practice. I have in mind, of course, uh, the late great Justice Scalia has already been referred to, but there are many others. Uh, many leading Australian judges today take a similar view. British judges, uh, if you're interested, largely steer clear of that scepticism. Uh, most still take legislative intent seriously. And my work has been an extended response to this, uh, this scepticism, aiming to provide some philosophical grounding for the old dispensation, attempting to demystify and thus to defend legislative intent. And my focus has been on the idea of legislative authority, what it's for and how it is to be exercised. And I've aimed to illuminate the nature of legislating by adopting the internal point of view 
of the reasonable legislator. In other words, have attempted to follow the reasons there are for legislation, for legislating, for having a legislature, in order to explain what legislating is and how legislatures act. Now, the way in which language works is very important, but it seems to me also to be secondary, secondary to questions in the philosophy of law, to reflection on the moral aim, the moral need rather for legislation, and thus the point of legislating. And when you're reasoning about this, Aquinas' understanding of law is instructive. It's an ordinance of reason for the common good, made by him who has care of the community and promulgated. John Finnis' elaboration of Aquinas' thought uh, frames that as an ordinance of reason for the common good in the mind of the ruler, which is adopted by the ruled as if it were their own. Now, I think that ably captures the idea that acts of legislating involve choosing a plan of action, which is intended to change the law and thus social life, a plan that the legislature aims to share with others. And the idea of intentional legislative action is not incoherent because it is possible for groups to have a plan of action, to understand themselves to be doing something together. The internal structure of modern legislatures is framed to this end, so that the many legislators can join in one legislative act. Well, what does this mean for statutory interpretation? The foundation of the practice is that we aim to understand the act of legislating, to understand how the legislature has exercised its authority to change the law. The legislature is an agent, it's capable of acting for reasons, which means we read statutes as an exercise of agency, as intentional acts. It has a number of further particular implications, uh, a few of which I want to just mention now. One should read the statute as an act of one person, one artificial person, which means it's presumptively coherent. The different parts of the statute are intended to work together. The internal context of the statute matters. The statute is an exercise of authority at a datable point of time. The context of enactment, rather than the context of adjudication, is indispensable. Understanding the Legislative Act requires one to reflect on the legislature's likely or apparent reasons for acting. The interpreter acts wrongly if he or she foists on the statute a meaning that one has good reason to think is not intended. The legislature's apparent purposes matter, but legislating involves the choice of means as well as ends. One should not simply attempt to maximize the ends that the legislature had in view, a point that Justice Scalia made uh, very powerfully. The history of the legislation before this particular enactment is highly relevant to interpretation, but I say the congressional record itself may be less than helpful. Now that last point may seem um, a bit mysterious in view of everything else I've said, so let me explain as a way of bringing things to a conclusion. As I see it, legislative intent is the object of the interpretive exercise. It's what we aim to identify and to give effect. In other words, it's not a further source of evidence or argument, which might be listed alongside other sources, such as grammatical sentence meaning or consequences. And it does not reduce to the remarks made by individual legislators. Instead, the various sources of interpretive argument help to reveal intent. Recognizing legislative acts as intentional exercises of authority helps to order and discipline the various interpretive arguments or types of argument that are otherwise disordered and liable to misfire. These are, I think, some of the truths about legislating and interpretation that have long informed our practice. The truths that should, I suggest, be recognized and restored to the center of that practice and to theory about that practice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Professor Grove. All right, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I want to thank both Professor Walsh, my former law school classmate, um, and Professor Alcea for, uh, for organizing this. I'm sorry that Professor Alcea could not make it here. Um, I have my computer out so I can get, get quotes right, but I guess I'm here to defend Justice Scalia. <laughs> uh, seems, to be, seems to be my job, and I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, so much of my work has also been in the statutory area, and that's where I'm going to focus my comments, although I think many of my comments also apply to some notions of constitutional interpretation. So what does intent mean? So intent can mean kind of the subjective intent that gets attacked all the time, uh, the, notion that, the, the notion that all the members of Congress cannot possibly have the same intent. Uh, 
or it can mean a more objectified intent, um, which I take it to be closer to what Professor Egan's is saying and actually what Justice Scalia talked about. Um, and so what did folks back in the 19th century mean? So if you look back at statutory decisions from the 19th century, and for my recent paper, The Misunderstood History of Textualism, I looked at every case um, from 1789 to 1940, 1945 that used the term plain meaning. In the 19th century, you actually see a lot of references to intent. It's true. Um, Chief Justice Marshall referred to intent quite a bit. So for example, in United States versus Wiltberger in 1820, Chief Justice Marshall said, the intention of the legislature is to be collected from the words they employ. But note, what he's talking about is very much an objective intent. How do I know that? Uh, one, in the early 19th century, in 1820, legislative history was not readily available to the Supreme Court. So it would have been very hard to go back and look at the debates and try to figure out what do the individual folks think. Um, I also feel very confident about that because of the actual result in this case. Um, so United States versus Wiltberger, which was just picked out of a hat by me. This has been called by John Manning and John Yoo, one of, the, one of the quintessential examples of Chief Justice Marshall's approach to statutory interpretation. The case involved whether the federal courts had jurisdiction over a criminal case out of China. Uh, there was a manslaughter that was committed on an American ship off what is called the Tigris River in China. And by the way, for those of you who are thinking, well, there's no Tigris River in China, I've checked. That's what the case says, um, but I haven't been able to find out where the Tig Tigris River was, but it was a very small river. The statute at issue allowed for federal jurisdiction on the high seas. And Chief Justice Marshall said, there's really no way the high seas will include a river. That was very much supported by the structure of the statute because other provisions of the statute did actually allow the federal courts to have jurisdiction over manslaughter and other crimes committed on rivers, um, but not this particular one. Now the problem was, this meant there was no way to prosecute the manslaughter. And this is precisely what the government argued in the early 19th century. Early 19th century. So they said to the Supreme Court, look, if the American courts don't have jurisdiction, no one will prosecute this crime because the Chinese courts will not exercise jurisdiction over a crime committed by foreigners on a foreign ship. Chief Justice Marshall said, quote, it was extremely, extremely improbable that Congress meant to preclude jurisdiction over this crime. But that's what the statute said. And so that's what the court said. So when you fast forward to the late 19th century, there are more references to what we would call a more subjective intention. And that's in large part because at that time, people could look at the legislative history. And so you get cases like Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States, which is probably familiar to many people in this room. Um, in Church of the Holy Trinity, the case involved whether a pastor from England um, could, be, could be brought in by the church, even though there was a statute prohibiting contracts of labor. Now the Supreme Court said, look, of course, the pastor is going to do work. He's, that's part of labor. But we just do not believe it was the intent of the legislature to preclude elites like a pastor from coming to the United States to do work. So we're going to read this provision as manual labor, even, that's, even though that's not what it says. And that's really consistent with the title of the statute and the legislative history. So then we see a more subjective intent notion. So then there's the question of, well, does that mean multiple subjective intents? Or can we just assume that the entire Congress thought that it was not possible that a pastor would be included? Possibly. But then other, other statutes get, some, get much more complicated. So let me tell you about another case that got a lot of attention in the early 20th century. And that's a case called Caminetti versus the United States. Uh, Caminetti was about the Mann Act, which some of you have come across in constitutional law. Um, the, Mann Act, the Mann Act at the time prohibited um, the transportation of women uh, for prostitution, debauchery, or any other immoral purpose. Um, in that case, Mr. Caminetti, who was uh, 
from a prominent family and one of his buddies uh, took two, two young women to Las Vegas, Nevada, and then back to California. Um, both men were, every, it was widely known they were involved in an extramarital affair. Um, why the U.S. attorney went after them is not 100% clear, but Caminiti's father had just been appointed by the Wilson administration to be the um, head commissioner of immigration. And it is quite possible that the Republican, um, the Republican prosecutors involved were keen on prosecuting Caminiti's very democratic family, not clear. Uh, but the case, the case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the question is, does the term any other immoral purpose include non-commercial vice? These people were engaged in immoral conduct by many folks' uh, estimation, but was it criminal? Well, a lot of people said, including a lot of scholars, the legislative history indicated no, this didn't apply to this didn't apply to non-commercial vice. The majority of the Supreme Court said, yes, it did, relying on the text. Um, and the decision was pilloried by countless scholars for going against the legislative history and the intent of Congress. But interestingly, after Justice Day issued the opinion, Representative Mann, the namesake of the legislation, sent Justice Day a private letter saying, you know, there may not have been any public statement to this effect in the legislative history, but I just want you to know you are 100% right. That statute totally applied in this case. So it turns out that not everybody agrees on the meaning of the statute, even in cases that might seem obvious to many of us. And I think that is why the legal realists first, then the legal process purposivists, then Justice Scalia's textualists rejected the idea of subjective intent, saying that it is much more important to look at what the lawmakers enacted than what they thought they were trying to do. Now, would it be nice if legislation were really all clean and crisp and clear such that there was never any sort of, any sort of dissonance in a federal statute? Yes, that would be great. Um, it would also be great if Congress did a lot more things. I mean, I, I have all sorts of opinions, all sorts of opinions on that. But that's not how the sausage is made. So one can picture an idealized legislature, but that's not the one we have. The one we have is one in which compromises are constantly being made. And this is one of the major insights of Justice Scalia and now Dean of Harvard Law School, John Manning. In order to be true to the Article I bicameralism and presentment process, it is important to respect the fact that that process allows political minorities to bargain for political compromises and sometimes to demand half a loaf. The majority will get half a loaf in order to get, in order to get enough legislators on board. And so you get statutes that don't actually make a lot of sense sometimes, but that's what got enacted. To my mind, that is the heart of modern textualism. Um, and it's a modern textualism that I would love to see kept alive. Well, thank you. Uh, there's, there's sort of a, a trick to moderating, uh, which I think I'm going to resist. Because uh, right now, we have a lot of issues on the table. And I could just say, you respond, uh, right? Because there's, there's a lot. But let me first, I want to return to the Constitution for a moment. Um, and, and my first question is for Professor Drakeman. Uh, and it's um, about your reference to a misdirection in the mode of ratification, because it seems to me that, uh, yes, the mainstream of the Western legal tradition would look to the intention of the lawmaker, finding in human positive law, we look to the will of the lawmaker. But we have a lot of different kinds of rules for what sort of intent we're looking for, uh, depending on the nature of the legal instrument. And the nature of the legal instrument uh, might vary depending on who made it. Okay, so we would have different rules for interpreting uh, a will, testamentary provision, or a contract, uh, or a statute. And it seems to me that the main debate for well, the first several decades of constitutional law uh, in and out of courts is over the nature of the Constitution, uh, which in part is over the nature of the Union. And it seemed to me that that is necessary to, in some ways, mm -hmm. have a position on that debate, right? So you have compact theory, uh, 
uh, right, that it's an agreement uh, uh, between the states, or you have uh, what I would call the right view uh, that views it as a product of we the people of the United States as a, as a single unit. Now, even that correct view does not map on to the process of ratification because we'd have both the ratification conventions as well as the framers. Uh, and so uh, my question, uh, Professor Drakeman, is when we're looking for this intent, uh, you said it's a misdirection, but how do we find the intent of the lawmaker in this case, just stipulating that I'm correct on the nature of the union, but I will say I'm following John Marshall and Abraham Lincoln. Uh, how do we find the intent of the people of the United States when it comes to this particular lawmaking act? So that's a good question. And, and there are you know, probably about 250 pages worth of, of good answers to try to address it. But let me start a couple of very practical ways, and I'll back into it from the Bill of Rights. Unlike the Constitutional Convention, the Bill of Rights was open. Uh, the negotiations were in the first Congress, uh, and the debates were covered in the newspaper on a you know, same week basis. And what we see in the annals of Congress is what the American public and the ratifiers saw in their newspapers. And so if you're looking at, at the Bill of Rights, and that's a place where a lot of these arguments have taken place uh, regarding intent and text and meaning, uh, we know what the American public knew, which is what the ratifiers knew. And so there isn't an issue of access. Uh, there's, there's, there may be insufficient evidence. And Blackstone said, everybody said, the best evidence of, of what the intent was is what the words are. So everything that Professor Grove said, I think, is true. Uh, I think we get into more difficulties when intent is used as a hand-waving excuse for making a, a decision that has nothing to do with the language. Uh, but, but also, textualists tends to be, tend to be a bit on the optimistic side about the nature of meaning. And so when we look at, at uh, Justice Patterson's decision in the Hilton case, which is the one Professor Alice and I wrote about, and where we saw this absolute equal possibility of one reading or the other reading being opposite readings, uh, that, that what the intention was was very clear in what the, the convention was trying to do. In the 1820s, there weren't many framers left, but in, in 1790s, there were framers on the court, and they could actually say, as Patterson did, this is what we did. And he can, we can also look at them and say, and I myself didn't like this compromise. This is a bad compromise, in my opinion, but I'm going to enforce it because uh, that is what the convention decided to do. That's how we solve the problem, it, you know, all related to taxation and, and slavery and the relationship of the two. And so uh, I think as a practical matter, uh, these things can work. When you get to a, 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 a duct issue, like what the Commerce Clause means, what the extent of federal power is, which, Professor Walsh, you're alluding to, it's fun to read St. George Tucker's Blackstone uh, uh, versus uh, James Wilson and, and, uh, and Joseph's story on that issue, because they just don't agree. And, and really, most of the constitutional commentaries from the 19th century uh, are written to argue over just how much power the federal government has vis-a-vis uh, -vis the states and vis-a-vis -vis the people. So, you know, intention doesn't solve everything. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm in, in Professor Eakin's camp that, that it's what we ought to be looking for, but we ought not to use it as a kind of get out of jail free card when the language is against us. Okay. Would you like to comment on that or keep going? Well, I mean, quickly, I'm, I think you must be right that the, you know, the nature of, of the Constitution as a, if it is a lawmaking act, is, is pretty critical. Um, obviously, who, who the lawmaker is, and is, is this conceived by the people who are involved in the making of it and, and the reception of it and the, so the life of it as, as a discrete lawmaking act? Is it a lawmaking act like a contract, like a statute, 
or is it more like the beginning of a common law practice? Those, those seem like critical distinctions. Now, from afar, obviously, I'm not American, it looks like a lawmaking act to me. And so uh, uh, with Don, I think, in a sense, the way in which um, uh, the relevant participants at the time would have been thinking about lawmaking acts would have framed the way in which they would understand the nature of their action. Uh, now, it, might, it looks to me as though what you might have is a, is a practice that begins with a legislative act, with an unusual uh, ad hoc legislature, if you like, and important questions to be asked about um, what type of enterprise are we engaging in here? Are we creating a new political community? Mm -hmm. Yes, in some sense, what type? Uh, but over time, it may, may be the fact that people in the United States are at least not saying uh, Don's poll, are not that keen on consider and continuing to treat it as a, as a legislative act. It's going to be, in a sense, much more like the grounding for a common law practice. I think you've got a kind of equivocation between those two things uh, in, in the constitutional law that, that follows. Um, that's what I'd say. I'll let you ask your next question. Okay. Well, uh, so there was, there was mention made of, of St. Thomas Aquinas' definition of law as an ordinance of reason for the common good made by one with care of the community or with lawmaking authority and promulgated. And uh, some of Professor Gro Grove's comments seem to focus, uh, if we were to map this onto uh, Aquinas' okay. definition or understanding of, of all law, that, uh, that the textualist uh, has something very important to say about promulgation uh, and might say, well, you intentionalist, uh, you overemphasize uh, the, the ordinance of reason for the common good and made by one with, uh, with lawmaking authority and uh, give insufficient attention to this element of promulgation and you need uh, that. Uh, so if, uh, if you don't have uh, law, uh, at least the central case of law, uh, without promulgation, uh, then is the textualist correct that the text is the law and therefore, and you see the move right there, <laughs> that, uh, that, so that because the text is the law, then the textual meaning is the law, the meaning of the text. In other words, once you have promulgation, um, the intention uh, drops out. And this will go to our intentionalists and uh, Professor Eakins. Sorry, my voluntary shake that. of my head betraying uh, my, my answer. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question, obviously. Promulgation is, is vital. And I, I'd say that you know, the text of the statute is not the law. Uh, the legis it's an act of the legislature, an act of Congress, act of Parliament. And the act is the choice of certain propositions to be law. Now, that choice has to be promulgated, absolutely. And it's the utterance of the statutory text at the time of enactment publicly uh, that, that um, makes that choice uh, authoritative, that is an exercise of the authority that your constitutional order confers on the, on the legislature. So by all means, the intention has to be promulgated, and it's promulgated by uttering the text in the relevant context so that the intention can be recognised. Uh, it's, I mean, it, um, I mean the, the, the sort of private reflections of the of the lawmakers and the letters they send afterwards are, are very interesting in the, the sort of clash between them. Likewise, uh, I don't think you can exercise legislative authority without making the lawmaking intention manifest to the people you are exercising authority over. So I, I'm not wanting to let promulgation slip, uh, but I think it's entirely consistent with what you're doing when you legislate is to make your lawmaking intention and and more precisely the intended meaning of the text in question, clear. I think you know, lawyers are very good at handling texts in lots of ways, and I think we, we mislead ourselves to think that, that the text itself is the law rather than the, the meaning that is made uh, uh, known to uh, the, the community by uttering the text. Good, and, and I'm going to pitch this There's to you. There's something a bit... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'll be quick. There's something a bit question begging about saying that the text is the law, because then you have to, to say, well, what's the meaning of a text? And, and the meaning of the text is not in the, I mean, you can go word by word and say, you know, here are the range of possible meanings, but you have to make sense of it. And to make sense of it, you have to start getting into some questions like, wasn't this a communicative act? Is somebody trying to tell somebody else something, which in fact it is. It is a lawmaker telling the public what the law is. And as a result, very hard to sustain, except in theory, which is of course what we do, but, but except in theory, it's very hard to sustain an argument that words mean only uh, some 
you know, sort of objective fact found in a dictionary published somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so I want to begin by by agreeing with um, some of what my interlocutors have said. Um, I think that sometimes textualists have said sloppily, the text is the law. It is true that promulgation is important, and actually, I think for textualists, that's where the intent matters. It's the intent to to sign on to this legislation. Um, and then the text is the law that bicameralism for presentment provides a rule of recognition for federal statutes. That's how we know stuff gets into the statute of lar statutes at large, and that's what we interpret. Um, but the fact that the text is the law doesn't tell you how to interpret that law. And I think that's why it's important that folks like Dean Manning have focused on the bicameral bicameralism and presentment process itself and the power that it gives to political minorities to bargain for compromises as a way of understanding why sometimes statutes don't make sense. And even when they don't make sense, you kind of have to enforce them as they are. Now, all that said, um, in some of my more, more recent scholarship um, that um, different from the, the stuff that Professor Walsh mentioned earlier, I've been digging into, well, how do we actually interpret the text? Um, and I do want to say this about a lot of textualist scholarship up till now. Um, when textualists talk about, well, how do we figure out plain meaning? They're used to, usually doing it in kind of, kind of the defensive. <laughs> well, we're not going to look at purpose. We're not going to look at substantive canons most of the time and we're not going to look at legislative history. But then that leads to the question, like, well, what are you going to look at? Um, and that's actually some of the, one of the things that I've been, I've been dealing with in recent work. I have a, I have a new paper on textualism and precedent, and statutory precedent. Um, and I'll just tell you, one of the things I've found um, is that a lot of textualists look at prior Supreme Court case law to figure out what words mean. And that's, by the way, not just in the world of statutory interpretation. If you look at Heller um, on, in constitutional interpretation of the Second Amendment, Justice Scalia did that, too. Um, they look at case law, Supreme Court precedent, um, typically from the era of enactment or prior cases trying to figure out the meaning of statutes from the era of enactment. Um, they also look at, of course, surrounding structure. They look at dictionaries. But they look, a, they look at a lot of stuff. Uh, and I actually think one of the big challenges for textualism is, is figuring out, well, which stuff counts. Um, and that's a lot of what my which textualism piece was about, um, and recognizing that there are divisions among textualists about that. The other thing I'll say, and I think in this way, Professor Eakins and I probably agree, and Professor Drake, Drake may agree as well, there are an increasing number of people who argue that the text is the linguistic meaning. Uh, and this has driven a lot of scholarship, much of it critical of textualism, um, and some of it is empirical. Uh, scholars have recently gone out and surveyed the public. All right, here's, the, here's a little snippet of the statutory text. Here's a scenario. What do you think? And the idea being if 51% or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90% of the public thinks X, that must be the ordinary meaning of the statute. Now, my reaction to this scholarship when I first came across it was, are you kidding me? Um, so I apologize if anybody's a follower of this, but I found this baffling, but it's a thing now. Um, and I think it comes from this idea that ordinary meaning is this linguistic, ordinary conversational meaning, such as the meaning of a federal statute is like a conversation on the street or a TV ad. Um, and actually some scholarship writes like this. It's astounding to me. And one of the things that I tried to do in a recent essay and I'm doing in my, my current paper is to push back against this. Statutes are law. And law is a special language. That's why when I said to my mom very early on in my, my career, she said, what are, we, what are we working on? I said, oh, I'm, writing an, I'm writing a paper about standing. She looked at me. My mom's not a lawyer. She looked at me and she was like, oh, your next paper is going to be on sitting and then walking. <laughs> like, this is, <laughs> this is a direct quote. Um, well, I think this underscores the point, right? To everyone in this room, you know exactly what I was talking about. I was talking about Article Three standing doctrine, the way you get into federal court. But to a non-lawyer, that's absurd, right? Because standing is a very ordinary term. Law is a special language, a special le legal language, and should not be treated as a matter of linguistic fact. Well, I'd like to open it up for um, questions from the audience, but I will just have one provocation since um, we're all mic'd, so I have the mic for a moment. I would just suggest that part of the um, 
uh, part of the shame uh, of our disagreement and our loss of understanding of how to interpret legal enactment is, I think, uh, the, the fact that we haven't had constitutional amendments because why would you put uh, out into this world uh, that is so confused, why would you put new text uh, mm-hmm. out uh, and, 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 and as an expression of a lawmaking act, which is a shame. And so we've lost the um, uh, activity of lawmaking and that, that we might be in a vicious circle. Uh, so um, to that, uh, now um, on that friendly uh, <laughs> note, I'll, I'll open it up in the back, yeah. Uh, wait, please wait for a mic to come over. Uh, thank you. Uh, I might simply be advertising my own philosophical deficiencies, but I wonder if Professor Grove's concept of objectified intent isn't really the key to showing that this whole supposed grand conflict between intentionalism and original meaning is really just illusory. Uh, and it just seems to me that there may be so much overlap between these concepts, people using different words to mean the same thing. And in furtherance of that, let me present this challenge to the intentionalists. Let's assume that a, we'll say a statute is enacted uh, in 1850 uh, that, uh, that's interpreted to mean something, and then 20 years later we get a uh, discovery of a sworn statement by all the enactors that a phrase that seems to say something meant something completely different. Now, now uh, so here you have you know, uh, it, the, the evidence is as sure as you can uh, want it to be that the actual intention, the subjective intention of all of the enactors was something, something different, but, but surely we enforce the objectified intent in the law, do we not? You're I'll stop here, there. you're um, there. But fine, so is this an illusory distinction, the difference? Uh, it touches on some, some things that Professor Grove um, arrived on, I think. And when I think about Justice Scalia's uh, interpretive work, and you've probably everyone in this room has read many more of his cases than I have, but I've read some. Uh, and I very often agree with how Justice Scalia interprets particular legal materials. I thought his interpretive practice was better than his interpretive theory. Um, there are points, I think, where the theory makes a difference. And, and the unwillingness to try to discern uh, what, the, what Congress intended will result in a, in a different understanding. When you deliberately close your eyes to uh, what you can infer from the other evidence was the decision that was made. Now, the example you give of your, your 1850 statute and so on is, is one that I'm not terribly discomforted by, and, and I encourage you to read my, the last chapter of my book on Legislative Intent, which sort of talks about precisely this. And it's, a, it's an old idea and a, and a, and a good one, of course. Um, because I think one, one has to infer in, in the intention of the lawmaker, and this is the consistent common law practice for good reason, from publicly available evidence. This is partly the significance of promulgation. Now, that, this, we haven't really talked much more about the difference between subjective and, and objective intention, but I'm certainly adamant that legislative intent does not collapse to the congressional record, the parliamentary record. Um, in England, we, we forbade reference to the, the legislative history in this sense till about... Uh, 19, the 1980s, I think, and even now we're, we're pretty dubious on it. Consistent, though, with thinking, when we read a statute, we're reading a deliberate decision by an agent, and we should marshal the materials with a view to inferring what their decision is from the publicly available evidence. So, I mean, in a sense, I think it's impossible for there to be a uh, you know, the conspiracy of the legislators um, where they, they secretly intend something that they, they haven't made manifest by their, their collective action. But even if they did, they were or simply trying to disprove my theory, uh, um, I'd be unimpressed by it and not think the legal system should respond, which uh, you, you likewise. But I think that's consistent with the priority of legislative intent and for this making a difference in, in some cases. You know, I think Justice Scalia was sometimes wrong when he interpreted statutes uh, um, because of the, the theory leading him astray. Professor Drakeman, did you want to follow up on that? I, I don't think I can improve on that. I, I think I think that's a, a very good answer, and uh, and with a statute, it's an easy one. Um, unlike your constitutional amendment question, which is uh, if all those legislators thought it was interpreted badly, they just write write another statute that is a lot clearer about how to interpret it. Uh, so um, I, I will leave it to you. Okay, very good. Uh, we have a question in the front here, please. Hi. Um, 
the Constitution begins, we the people of the United States, and then it says, do or they establish um, the government. So in my view, that is the ultimate lawmaker, the ultimate sovereign of, through which all lawmaking power derives. And all the people, the legislatures, are all just agents of the people. So why isn't it the people's understanding of what the Constitution or statute means um, that should be uh, the lawmaker? I think we'll, uh, Professor Drakeman, did you hear the question? And, and can you take the first uh, crack at answering that, please? One would be, I, I don't think any of us are arguing in favor of, of an interpretation that, that, that nobody um, understood. But the people, when they're engaged in lawmaking, uh, decide to do it through agents like uh, conventions or congresses. And uh, we, we allow them to make laws in, as Professor Grove said, the language of law which is not necessarily uh, the language of every member of we the people, some of whom in, in um, founding year America, by the way, did not speak English uh, and uh, were only exposed to the Constitution in, in translation in their native languages. So that adds a whole nother set of issues. But I'll start with that, is that we, we delegate this lawmaking to somebody and uh, th those are the, you know, that's what we're talking about when we're searching for the intention of the lawmaker uh, in the way that Professor Eakins and I have described. Uh, yes, right in the front here, please wait. Hi, uh, my question, it might actually be a topic for research or maybe a panel, uh -huh. it goes to the uh, monetary system, central banking, what we use for money. And I would point to Article 1, Section 10 of our Constitution, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. And those words were written primarily by Roger Sherman, a founder who in 1752 wrote a paper uh, titled A Caveat Against Injustice or an Inquiry into the Evils of a Fluctuating Medium of Exchange. They were very well aware then that, that paper credit money could become a tool that extracts wealth from those who labor and transfers it to you know, more vested interests. So uh, very clear the documentation there, also in Andrew Jackson's farewell address, that uh, we're meant to have a money circulating that isn't easily inflated to reward uh, primarily those who even are in urban areas versus those who labor to produce the, the food of a nation. Okay, well, I'll take that. Was, the, was there a question at the end uh, in terms of intention? Uh, in other words, are you asking? Well, the, actually, I would contrast maybe the understanding of intent, going back to this man's question about uh, we the people. The law is supposed to be of the people, and uh, the law isn't meant to be something that the people can't even engage in themselves. But, of course, the world has become such that, yeah, we have to employ professional lawyers to argue a point. So uh, closer to the time of the founders, a representative um, might have been thinking more of representing what their people, their constituents wanted, whereas today, with the nature of uh, campaign donations, uh, they're okay, perhaps... I can, I, I'll take this one. They're looking more to, to please their those who finance their campaigns to get reelected. I, I, I will say Article 1, Section 10 is a, is a very challenging... Uh, provision of the Constitution. And it's interesting because Professor Grove mentioned this Wiltberger case. Uh, you know, one of, the, is one of the challenges, so I would say my first um, instinct would be it's question of interpretation, uh, WWJMD, what would John Marshall do? Uh, but this is a problem, uh, in, including for Article 1, Section 10. Uh, you have the Contracts Clause, for example, uh, is a very uh, challenging one. And interestingly, uh, John Marshall's sole dissent in a constitutional case came in a case called Ogden versus Saunders in which he used some of the very same language um, that Professor Grove mentioned. So I do think that there is some broad agreement even on some harder questions. How we address them today is more challenging. Um, one more question uh, from, from the audience. Um, we'll go to, um, right in the back there. Thanks. Uh, I want to address the question of, of who is the, um, uh, is the author of the Constitution in some sense. Uh, so we've heard that it's we the people who are 
the, the legislative power here. Um, I want to shift the focus a little bit uh, to thinking that uh, it's the states who transferred sovereignty to the federal government. So it's not the entire we the people as an undifferentiated mass, it's uh, the states. Um, and uh, that leads to some interesting uh, consequences. This was highlighted recently by an article by Brad Clark and A.J. Balia that just came out in the Notre Dame Law Review. Uh, and uh, they point out that in a situation where one set of sovereigns is transferring uh, certain sovereign rights to another sovereign, that the law of nations governed interpretation of such an instrument. And they posit that the U.S. Constitution was such an instrument. Uh, so, uh, they say, uh, first of all, that any transfer, any such transfer of rights had to be in clear and expressed terms, and they also point out that according to the law of nations, it had to be uh, interpreted according to the ordinary and customary meaning as of the time of adoption. Uh, so, uh, so those are their thoughts, and I'm interested in uh, the reaction of the panelists to that. Well, uh, Professor Drakeman, I think I will um, pitch this one uh, to you insofar as some of the, some of the, so, so, but I will say this, um, uh, this idea, or some of our questions focuses on something that I think is in common uh, among all the panelists, which is how to understand the Constitution as law depends on what kind of law it is, right? And, and, uh, and, and then we're off to the races, though, um, in debating that, because the, the question includes, I'd say, some fairly Jeffersonian premises uh, that you might find in St. George Tucker uh, or something like that. But Professor Drakeman, um, uh, uh, th and this will be the, the final answer from the panel, uh, <laughs> and, and we will uh, uh, take this up in, in the reception. So Professor Drakeman. Well, my, my first instinct is to say if, if the speaker is correct, uh, then this session should have been uh, about how to interpret the Articles of Confederation, which remain our governing document. Uh, that is the clearest uh, case of a, of a uh, delegation by the states to a central government that has not, as far as we know, been done away with. Um, I think if you look in the, the um, interna international um, uh, law context and look uh, more broadly at what people from Grotius and Kufendorf and, you know, all the way back to Turamini and Suarez and a variety of others uh, uh, in the Catholic uh, intellectual tradition, for that matter, uh, you'll see that the intentionalism uh, that Professor Eakins and I have described from Aquinas on forward actually goes back way further than that and, and would be found as much uh, in uh, matters of um, legal agreements between sovereigns as anybody else. So um, I'll go back and look at that some more because it hasn't been my focus, but, uh, but I think that uh, is certainly an interesting question to which I don't have an equally interesting answer. <laughs> <laughs> well... Please um, join me in thanking our panelists and our host of the Heritage Foundation, Richard Ryan. We are done. <laughs>